Please welcome to the stage the CEO of Community Individual Development Association and Maharishi Institute and Singularity University South Africa faculty, Dr. Taddy Bletcher. Good morning, everybody. There is a proverb. It says, if you want to be rich for one year, you should grow grain. If you want to be rich for 10 years, you should grow trees. If you want to be rich for 100 years, you should grow people. I'm going to be talking about growing people in extraordinary ways, in unthinkable ways. You've heard some mind-blowing stuff already, I think, from Suzanne about the tech side of what's going to be happening in this almost unthinkable future that we're going into. I'm going to be talking about the human side, about reinventing our education systems and why that is so necessary, about disrupting the way we think about university education, about creating a world in which literacy and knowledge is available to every single human being on the planet. I love that Peter Diamandis quote up at the back there, the best way to predict the future is to create it. I believe that the future of Canada and the future of the world is going to depend very, to a very great deal on the quality and innovation that we bring into our education systems. I also believe that human beings are far greater than we give ourselves credit for, and this is what I hope to prove for you, to you in the next 25 minutes. When I was young, growing up in South Africa, I wanted to be the richest man in the whole world. And this was probably because I grew up in a poor family, uh, three older brothers, four of us sleeping on the floor on foam mattresses in Johannesburg. We were a family of activists, my brothers, my father were green, uh, growing up, dreaming about ending apartheid, changing political situation. I was growing up dreaming just to be rich and I wanted to be able to be successful. And then what happened is apartheid ended in 1994 and I started to think about leaving South Africa like so many other people who felt the country's changed and we uh, see many South Africans came to this country, to Canada. And just to recap a little bit on what happened in my family when we were growing up. Um, my father arrived in the country when he was one year old, came with his parents. They, they escaped Nazi persecution from Latvia just at the start of the Second World War. Arrived in South Africa on a boat with literally the shirts on their backs. They had absolutely nothing. They were so poor that they had to send my father away for the first eight years of his life. He grew up with some distant relatives that had come from Latvia some years before to the country. And when my father came back at eight years old and he started to think, how is he going to change things for his family? He decided that the way he was going to do this was through education, that he would get educated. Somehow he would put himself through university and then he would educate his now brother and sister that he just met for the first time. This is how he would change things for the family. And this is what he did. He started working odd jobs when he was in high school. Every single cent he saved up and he ended up putting himself through university, became a medical doctor, did a first degree, went on, did a master's PhD, a few more PhDs, ended up getting seven degrees, paid for the education for his brother and sister. He had five kids, paid for all of our education. And he ended up paying for, he was a gynecologist and obstetrician, all his nurses' children, and he put over 34 people through university that, that we were aware of. And we had no money for anything growing up, so I never had new clothes until I was 12. Everything was a hand-me-down from Mark to David to Greg, eventually to me. All my school uniforms had ink stains on them, the pockets were torn, and this is how it was, but we went to the best private schools even though we didn't have money for anything else. And the other thing that my father did is he hated apartheid, given how he had grown up. He hated this idea of separation between people. And he used to give two days of every week to go and see black women in jail. There were women's jails, people like Albertina Sisulu, uh, other, other great heroes of our struggle, for no reason other than the color of their skin were thrown in jail. And he would take their medicine, deliver their babies, um, and we would be young, sometimes waiting outside these prisons on Saturday morning, just waiting for him. This stuck in our heads. And in 1995, when I was about to emigrate and go to the U.S., 
I was an actuary, I had four degrees, I was earning a 1.3 million rand a year salary, so pretty good salary at 27. I decided two weeks before leaving that I wasn't gonna go, and it was this huge, massive change for me in my life and my life path. Instead of for the first time thinking that I just wanted to become incredibly successful, I decided to stay, and I decided to stay, I think, for this reason. Apartheid taught us, and it drummed it into our heads, that some human beings are better than others, and that's just how it is. And in South Africa, it was because of the color of your skin, and elsewhere in the world, it's for other reasons, but that's what we were taught, and that's how we grew up. And my family did everything they could to fight against this. I decided to stay in South Africa because I wanted to prove that assumption wrong. So I gave up my job, I didn't emigrate, and I went into one of the townships um, called Soweto, you might have heard of it, and another township called Alexandra, half a million to a million people living in shacks in one square mile. And we wanted to do something, I joined this little NGO, we wanted to try and prove that every single person in our country was brilliant, not just some of us. And we thought the way we would do this would be if we could create a revolutionary new kind of university which would take dropouts and street kids and kids who'd been in drugs and gangs and just whose lives had no future and no hope and if we could put them in university and instead of the traditional kind of university like Harvard and Stanford and Yale and Oxford where we take the 0.1% of a population, we bring in geniuses, out the other end they come out geniuses, we thought could we take the losers in society, people who are really stuck and who are really in trouble and could they come out as geniuses and that's what we set out to prove. I just want to say how great it is to be back in Canada. And I love this country in more ways than one, which I'll talk more about later. Not only are you one of the most welcoming nations on earth, but you actually, which is an incredible statistic, you are the most educated nation on this planet earth. You have, I think you should clap for yourself. That is unbelievable. You have the highest number of people in the world, relatively, who've actually been through university. You have one of the best literacy levels in the world, one of the best school education systems in the world. A couple of weeks ago, a study just came out showing that not only are you the most educated population in the world, you might not know, you're actually the healthiest population in the world on 10 different uh, uh, dimensions of health. And we know that education is very related to health. But we know, and I could tell you 100 indices about Canada that are beyond incredible. We know that there's massive disruption coming. We know already the Royal Bank of Canada's uh, predicting that within 10 years, there's a lot of automatable jobs in this country, that 25% of jobs um, will, will, will be lost within 10 years. You've already got, say, about 10% youth unemployment, that's not that high, but with another 25%, you could start to get up to some kind of levels of unemployment that can be serious. And how are you going to prepare for that? You're going to need to do a lot more with your human assets, and this is going to require some kind of reinvention of your education system. And Sean this morning was talking about a talent crisis. I want to take you to another part of the world where I come from, where I'm proud of, where I love to live, a place called South Africa, where vast amounts of humanity are actually left behind. And on the screen over here, you can see pictures from recent newspapers in South Africa of unemployed youth out there, violent, angry, upset. Third highest unemployment rates in the world, according to World Economic Forum. Over seven million unemployed youth. What does that look like? It is not a pretty picture. We have xenophobic killings, we have farm killings, we have over 7,000 uprisings in South Africa per year against the state, usually thousands of youth involved. That's over 20 protests per day, 365 days in a year. Now here's the extraordinary thing, is every single person that you see on the screen here has been through our school system. Everybody in South Africa goes into grade one. Everybody has gone to school. But the education systems failed them. Why? Because it's rote-based. They've learned how to just memorize stuff, write exams. Can we reimagine an education system that could work for everybody? A truly 21st century education system that develops all human potential. You may think, why is it relevant in Canada? I've just told you you've got the best education system in the world. Why does this matter? It matters because we're seeing rising inequality at a level we've never seen before in, in the world. Here's a shocking statistic that I heard about a year or two ago. 
and it's actually worse than it was a year or two ago, the eight richest men in the world, all men, control more wealth, have got more assets and wealth than the bottom half of the whole of humanity. That's 3.8 billion people. That is crazy. We live in a world that is extremely unsustainable when we think about the kind of uh, inequality we have. So I gave up my 1.3 million rand salary to try work on this issue. What I want to know is, could we do this just for one person? And on the screen here, you see a picture there of a little boy, a little lost boy. His name is Langanipo. He was from a family of 13 kids. He grew up in a rural village in KwaZulu-Natal, on the south coast of South Africa, brought up by his grandmother. He had lost his mother, he had lost his two aunts, and all the kids were brought up by the grandmother on a monthly pension from the state of $100. When he finished high school, nothing he could do, couldn't get into university because our universities in South Africa, unlike Canada, are not free. They've recently changed. And he ended up working as a, what we call a garden boy. He then worked as a taxi driver's assistant. He was earning 20 rand per day. That is 500 rand per month, $30 in a month. One day he was working up a gutter uh, and just cleaning the leaves on somebody's gutter. And his old school principal came running down the road and he said, Langanipo, you're not going to believe this. You've been awarded a scholarship to go to Johannesburg to go to university. And his school principal gave him the money uh, to, to, to come to Johannesburg. He's a typical student of ours. He had finished high school, but 95% of these students has got a literacy rate um, in terms of language skills between grade one and grade six. He had a maths literacy and pretty much 95% of them have maths literacy between grade two and grade five, although they've spent 12 years in the school system. 66% of the students coming into us are suffering from what is called post-traumatic stress disorder, and 40% on average are suffering from chronic depression. These are young people growing up in the townships, in poverty, in the squatter camps, in formal settlements, self-hatred, self-harming, post-traumatic stress, anxiety, insomnia, all these other things. Grown men, but like broken children. So, Langanipo came to a very different type of university. It's called the Marishi Institute. Uh, this is a university I started with, with some colleagues. And you'll read on the left here the kinds of things we do in a day in, in, in education. Start the day with yoga, breathing exercises, meditation, rest, reading software, math software, taking these students on boot camps into nature, sports and exercises, using technology in amazing ways to help them learn. Why do we do these things? Because for us, education, amazingly enough, is all about human beings. And it's about the hearts and minds of human beings. So for us, building self-esteem, self-confidence, these are the critical things that we have to do. I think we all know the Bob Marley song, Redemption Song. Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. The mind is everything. What does it mean to be human? I want you to close your eyes now for just five seconds. If everybody could please close their eyes for just five seconds. I'm going to take you through a journey of 12 years. Tlanganipo came through university for four and a half years. He got a job. I just want to show you a picture. You can open your eyes again. Here's Tlanganipo today. Up on the screen, a beautiful, proud, confident young man. When he came to us, he was dealing with drug addiction. He had been unemployed for some years coming out of the school system. It's incredibly low levels of literacy. Here he is today, and he earns a million rand a year, just, just under $100,000 a year. He's a vice president in a bank. He's earning 200 times what he earned before he came to our university. He's a leader in his community. He supports his grandmother and his 12 siblings. This is one student's story. And by South African standards, this is a miracle because this individual could never go to university. But could we do this for more than one student? Could we build a school like this? What if the answer is yes? So on the screen here, you can see the names of 11 individuals, just like Klanganipo. In fact, he's number three there on the screen. This is one of the largest banks in South Africa. They've got 35,000 employees. Everyone on the screen here is either a head of a national division of this bank or a vice president or assistant vice president. All of them earning between 800,000 and 2.4 million rand a year. How is this possible? These were dropouts, just like Langanipo, thrown away by society. Wherever they're coming from, refugee shelters, squatter camps, street kids, etc. 
society would say these kids could never, ever, it would be impossible that they could hold positions like this, head of equity derivatives, etc. Is that a fluke? We know the company Cisco. Cisco for years have run an annual networking competition. It had never, ever been won by an African before. It's only been won by Americans, I'm sure Canadians, Europeans, Japanese, and Chinese, etc. The first time this competition was ever won by an African was one of our students called Raymond, who had never touched a computer when he came to university. Accenture, we know the company, it's a, one of the top consulting firms in the world. Accenture in the last four years have employed 100 of our 80, 180 of our graduates and students. I don't know if anyone's ever applied to get into Accenture, it's not easy. That is an incredible achievement when one thinks where they've come from. So this is where we're up to today. 18,500 individuals, just like Klanganipo, who've taken off the streets, out of a life of poverty, put them through education. They earn today over 1.35 billion rand between them. We estimate they'll earn over 39 billion in their working careers, over 3 billion US dollars. They're supporting 150,000 family members between them. 70% of these students did not have university entrance, um, wh which means that they don't have good enough marks coming out of the school system. 70% of them are women, and over 90% of them are retaining their jobs beyond one year when they get employed in the beginning. And with Sir Richard Branson of the Virgin Group, we've trained 5,000 entrepreneurs who've created some extraordinary companies. What does this show? It shows us, and this is why I love to get out of bed every single day, because it shows me that apartheid was wrong. And what was drummed into my head every single day, that some human beings are better than others, is wrong. And that every human being has got so much more potential than we give them credit for. So what are the stakes? What if we could do this for everyone? What if we must do this if we want to create the future that we want? So this is Africa today, 420 million youth. But you'll see only one-sixth of those youth is in formal wage employment. 70% living on less than $2 a day. By the year 2050, we're going to have over 850 million youth across the continent. That's a dem demographic dividend of unbelievable magnitude. And either those youth are going to be in poverty, causing utter de like devastation, or if we could do what I've been talking about for all these youth, every single one of them, we could end poverty completely. We could improve health. We could lengthen lives. We could create this kind of abundant future that we dream of in singularity. We can crack unemployment, prosperity for all, have an unimaginable future for the world. And this, I do believe, is possible. I think human beings are capable of this. And I'm very fortunate to be chairing for South Africa, working with the Department of Education, a national government task team to reform our education system and to reach 13.9 million kids in our school system, which I'll talk more about. So if Canada has to think about this future of an AI revolution, and we see what's already happening in our country, we have to change our education systems. But first, why is it so hard to do that? The reason is because education that we all went through was content dominant. It was exam driven, it was rote based. In 10 seconds on Google, you can just find a lot of this information that you just memorized for exams at school. We tell students what to think, we don't teach them how to think, we don't awaken their passions. Really, it's an industrial, revolution-based system from the 19th century. It's like an old shoe that probably never fit properly in the first place, and it definitely does not fit in the 21st century. Let's face it, it was a system that was good for training robots, the old kinds of robots that were just automating just basic tasks over and over again. That's how we were bringing up young people, teaching them how to fit widgets in a factory. But when we see this kind of curve that you've seen several times this morning, and if you just read this um, quote from Ray Kurzweil here, co-founder of Singularity, what Suzanne was talking about, that by 2029, AI is going to have human capabilities across the board. By 2045, com artificial intelligence is going to be a billion-fold more powerful than the average human being. Just think about that for a second. I mean, that is an unbelievable thought. What if you do, what do you do if you're the Minister of Education of a country and you have to think about the fact that in 20, how many years is that? That's like in 
22 years, computers are going to be one billion times smarter than human beings. So ministers of education all over the world, I can tell you, are in a tiz. And all these frameworks are coming out. The World Economic Forum's come out with an amazing framework on the future of work. UNESCO's come out with a framework, something called the International Bureau of Education, the Center for Curriculum Redesign. Everybody's thinking, what are human beings going to have to be? What do we have to teach humans in the school system so that they are going to be able to cope and have jobs and have lives in this new kind of world? But what all these frameworks are doing is they tell us what a human being has to be able to do, but they don't tell us how. So I'm going to share with you what we've been doing over the last 25 years in South Africa and the last 20 years in creating this revolutionary university. How have we been able to achieve this with dropout kids? So the first thing I wanted to say, and so this is not, this is not just a million dollar question. It's not just a billion dollar question. This is a trillion upon trillion of dollar question. How are we going to educate human beings for the future to be relevant? How are we going to make education work for everyone? How are we not going to bifurcate the human species, given this kind of massive growing inequality that we see all over the world? So first thing I want to say about education, what we all know about education is true. You need great leaders, great headmasters and headmistresses. You need great teachers. You need to give high expectations to young people that they must go for gold. They have to go for the top. All of those are a given, and they're not necessarily very scalable. So when we think about how can we do this at scale, this is how we think about education. The first thing is how do we treat a person as a whole person? And then how do we develop this brain with brain-based learning? How do we leverage technology, which is an incredible gift to the world and to education? And then how do we awaken the actual talents and interests of, of young people so that they can become successful? So where do we start? The first place where we start is we turn Maslow's hierarchy on its head. And I think everybody knows Maslow's hierarchy. Maslow said that human beings, the first thing we want is shelter and food. Later on, we're going to want to have sex and reproduction. Somewhere along the chain, we're going to care more about self-esteem. And right at the top, when maybe we're 65, 70, we're going to think about self-actualization, what's my life purpose, etc. We say that's crazy. Can't we turn that upside down? Can't we start with purpose and inspiration? and self-actualization, and then let's see what happens. And we treat a student like a whole person, and just look at the face. That is one of our students there. Now tell me, this is a human being. She's not just an intellect. If, if she were to go into a normal institution, she's going to learn statistics, she's going to write some exams, she's going to get a textbook. That institution is not going to care what's going on in her heart, her mind, her ideas, her feelings, her ego, her consciousness, etc. But what have we seen over the last 18 years with our students is when you treat somebody as a whole human being, from the inside out, real magic happens. So some of the magic that we see, I'd mentioned that 66% of our students coming in are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. That's a hard thing to get rid of. When our students come into our institution doing things like meditation and all these things we do to develop their potential, this is a study that was just published last month in an international journal called Psychology Reports on our students. And what it found is that every single one of our students suffering from PTSD that they tested within six months was off this PTSD scale. Secondly, 40% of these students with chronic depression, within six months, none of them suffering from chronic depression anymore. They took a control university, one of the top universities in South Africa. They also found students with post-traumatic stress disorder and depression. After one year, those students were more depressed and nothing had happened to PTSD. And yet they were studying psychology and studying business. So again, you might say, is this just a South African issue? It isn't. If you look at research, recent research, 65 million Americans are suffering from a mental disorder, for example, or mental health issues. You probably know that as Canadians. Think about that in terms of Americans. But this is crazy. Normally, um, education doesn't care about this. So if you were a farmer and you were planting a field, you would want to make a fertile field. So if young people are coming in and really, they don't know who they are, they don't know where they're going, they don't love themselves, they've got no sense of anything. How are you going to create something magical with that individual? So surely every child deserves to come through an education system who's going to grow up learning to love themselves and other people, learning to know that their life was worthwhile. So two major things that we focus on is, firstly, how do we remove these stresses and blockages and barriers to learning? 
all this ADD, ADHD, Ritalin, everything else that we're putting kids on because they're struggling to learn. How do you deal with that issue? But then secondly, how do you, beyond the stress and the trauma and all these obstacles, develop this incredible, amazing, unbelievable thing called the human brain? This is a picture, quote from Scientific American. Average human brain's got 100 billion neurons. Each of these capable of 10,000 connections, 100 trillion connections. That's a thousand times more than all the stars in our entire galaxy. That is what our brains are capable of. IQ, EQ, emotional intelligence, creating anything, doing anything. A human being, it's an unbelievable thing if we develop this brain properly. And I'll show how we've been doing it in, in our institution. So we teach our students to do something called transcend, experience another state of consciousness using something called Transcendental Meditation. This is an EEG, encephalograph, electroencephalograph reading of an individual before he starts meditation, after two months, four months, two years, 15 years, and it's tracking alpha, beta, theta, and delta frequencies in the brain. And you can see that this brain is totally starting to wake up. Ray Dalio there, who started the biggest hedge fund in the world, said meditation more than anything was the biggest ingredient of whatever success I've had. Suzanne was talking about what is consciousness, and I want to say that consciousness, from, from my experience, is not, it's not so much waking up from being asleep, but it's really waking up from being awake. So we're all going through our lives being awake, but we're kind of half awake. We're not really awake. If we could really expand our minds and really wake up inside, extraordinary things start to happen. And there's an incredible book uh, by a guy called um, Tim Ferriss from 2016, a number one bestseller called The Tools of Titans, and he found that 80% of the top CEOs in the US now are meditating and of, of, of billionaires that he interviewed. Harvard did a study a few months ago, an MRI study, and what they found is that you can literally grow brain matter, the gray matter in the brain, within just eight weeks. So I want to quickly use an analogy of a computer. Does anybody remember getting an XD computer and then a 286? I was so excited to get my first 286, and then a 386, and then you got a 486, and when Pentium 1 came out, who remembers Pentium 1? God, those were the days. Those were heady days when Pentium 1s came out. And then today, if I gave you a Pentium 1, you'd think, gee, does he hate me? What's wrong with me? We can understand that computers can get smarter, their processing speed, their memory, everything else. Why can't humans get smarter? The truth is they can. So this is an example from a school, a, a Marishi school in corn farming, pig farming country in the middle of Iowa. It's a very unlikely place. Anybody can come into the school. When they come in, on average, they're in the 50th percentile of all Americans, and in the final year, they've gone up to the top one percentile on SAT tests of all Americans. This is what education should be. This is worthy of the name education, when we can take an average human being because none of us are actually average. We're all unique, we're all amazing. We have these tremendous gifts that education should be developing. So let's just talk about technology briefly, and then I wanna just finish with our moonshots. Technology cracks the scale issue. It allows us to package the world's best educators, get them out to a billion people, five billion people, provides high quality and consistency. We can use things like AI and VR and all these things like MOOCs, e-learning, et cetera. This is an incredible opportunity. And for example, with our students, most of our students are coming in reading at 20 words a minute, 30 words a minute. We need them reading at 300 to 500 words a minute. So we use software to do that. And the biggest gift of technology into education is this idea of personalization. When we all went to school and there were 20 of us in a class or 25, those days have to change because every one of us is an individual and we learn differently. This is what computers can do. They can be completely focused on you as an individual and help you learn in the best way that you need to learn. So we have to move from content to skills to meta-learning, metacognition, learning how we learn, creativity, problem solving, complex problem solving, etc., to real mastery. And real mastery is developing wise, great human beings. And friends, as technology becomes more powerful, and really when you hear about these things that by 2029, it will be indifferentiable indif thinking between what a computer, what a robot is and what a human is, we need to create more powerful people. 
We need to create more integrated people, more intelligent and wise people. Otherwise, this is the greatest threat to humanity, putting hugely powerful technology in the hands of underdeveloped people. So this is what the future, I think, is going to look like in education. Mass personalization, education which is focused on every de individual developing their full potential and using technology to help them on that journey in the fastest possible way. So I'll just conclude with three moonshots that are extremely powerful going on in the world today to leverage this mass personalization. The first one is the Global Learning X Prize Challenge. It's a $15 million, a $15 million competition funded by Elon Musk so that any child or adult would be able to teach themselves to read, write, and do mathematics in 15 months completely on their own using a tablet or just using scalable open source software. Why is this important? It's incredibly exciting. Why? Because we've got 700 million illiterate adults in the world today. We've got hundreds of millions of illiterate kids. Over a billion people in the world would be able to access the knowledge of the world if they could read and write. The second moonshot that we're working on is how do we take what we've learned? This experiment that we did to prove apartheid wrong, to take all these young broken individuals and turn them into world beaters, how do we do that across Africa? Creating ultra low cost universities that can be self-funding, bringing people into the middle class. Doing this for $2 a day, not $33,000 a year, which is the average cost in say, a U.S. university. Why is this important? Because in the U.S. alone, there's $1.3 trillion of student debt. It's elitist. It's not open access to everybody. What if we could make it open access to everybody? Disrupt university, reduce student debt, double the middle class everywhere, and create a more sustainable world. And lastly, reinventing school systems. Very, very necessary. Why? Because it's easier to mend it's easier to build strong children than to mend broken men and women. So this is something we're working on in South Africa. I'm very grateful to the Ontario school system who we've been working with as well, um, doing some incredible work. Professor Roger Martin from uh, Rutman and other great individuals in the I Think initiative. And we're bringing some of this stuff into our school system in South Africa. So I'd said I love Canada in more ways than one. Just this amazing woman on the left there happens to be my wife. And she grew up in Edmonton. And I'm doing a holy pilgrimage this afternoon to go to Buena Vista Road, uh, not very far from here, to go and see where she was born. So thank you, Edmonton, from all my heart. Uh, those are our children. <laughs> if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have that. I still want to become the richest man in the world, just like I did when I was young. The first trillionaire, in fact but not for myself, for other people, through other people. And here's a call to action to all of you. A lot of you are in business, you're focusing on the next thing. We're not thinking enough about our children and the future. If you want to change the world, change education. Get involved in transforming lives, transforming the lives of your own kids, their schools, your school system. Let's work together. Change the school systems in the world because we radically have to. Disrupting universities because we have to. Please connect. I want to conclude with my favorite quote, because we're hearing so much about tech, and this is from Shakespeare, Hamlet. He says, what a piece of work is a man. How noble in reason, how infinite in faculty, in form and in moving, how expressed and how admirable, in apprehension, how like an angel, in action, how like a god. Thank you very much.